Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. The Korean bar exam is one of the toughest in the world. While open to all, only a thousand candidates are admitted every year, less than 5% of test takers. Hopeful applicants often study for years in the hope of passing the bar, yet with failure comes foregone income young people joining the workforce at an ever-increasing age, and, of course, severe ailments such as depression and suicidal tendencies. The Korean government recently enacted a sweeping reform. The bar examination, in its traditional format, is gradually phased out and replaced with a law education system modeled after the United States. Students are now required to attend a graduate law school before sitting for the exam, but have much greater odds of succeeding. But what does it mean for the education of the next generations of Korean lawyers, the Korean judicial system, and its underlying philosophy? To learn more, we had the pleasure of interviewing Jasper Kim. Jasper Kim is professor at the Graduate School of International Studies of Iwa Women's University. He is the director of the Center for Conflict Management and was a visiting scholar at Harvard University. Professor Kim earned his bachelor from the University of California, San Diego, He's MSc from the London School of Economics and is JD from the Rutgers University School of Law. He is a US licensed lawyer in Washington, D.C., and prior to joining EWA, worked for Barclays Capital and Lehman Brothers. Professor Jasper Kim, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you for having me on the podcast. A topic you researched and the subject of today's interview concerns the recent reforms in Korea's legal education system. Why did you decide to do some research on that topic? I thought it was a real niche area. Certainly there was some writing about and research about Korean law and the transformation of the Korean legal profession, but nothing really that was comprehensive and nothing that really struck at what I thought was a revolutionary change in Korea's legal tradition. So being a lawyer myself and having worked with Korean lawyers and all their types of lawyers, being educated in many countries, I thought that this would be a very, very interesting topic to talk about. Today we are going to focus on the recent changes in the Korean legal education system, mostly during the past 10 years or so. But before going there, let's first talk a little bit about how it was uh, a century ago. So under the Joseon dynasty, who held the duty of lawyers and judge? How did one obtain such a position? The Korean legal tradition goes back you know, over 100 years. During the Korean Joseon dynasty, there were a couple of institutions uh, that started the Korean legal law school process. One of them is known as Korea University today uh, and it's transformed into 25 government approved law schools here in 2015. So during the Chosun Dynasty period and up to the new Korean law schools being formed in 2009, the short version is, is that a lot of people could take the Korean bar exam. The thinking was to democratize the system so that one does not have to come from an elite background or family to sit for the Korean bar exam or a similar type of exam to become part of the Korean judiciary. And the challenge there and the problem that was presented was that this often was a challenge in and of itself because it took years and years of studying to even have a shot and a very remote shot of success of passing the Korean bar exam. And the Korean bar exam during its history, the traditional Korean bar exam, not the new one, has had an average passage rate of less than 5%. So in fact, it was supposed to represent hope. It actually represented an audacity of false hope because it lured many people into thinking or taking a shot at being a Korean lawyer, giving up full-time jobs, taking years off to focus solely on passing this extremely difficult, nearly impossible exam and most of the people fail. And what do they do after their full-time job was essentially to study for one exam that they failed? It's hard to re-enter the workforce, and so um, how do you recover from that? It was an, an idealistic attempt, but it had these challenges, and I think that was part of the motivation of changing Korea's law school system into a more Anglo-American style system. An interesting fact is that during the colonization, Korean nationals were still allowed to learn law and become lawyers. Why is that? Well, I think the short answer was to create loyalty for the Japanese occupation. If there were no Koreans sitting in the Korean judiciary, 
the chances of outright rebellion, particularly against the judiciary, when the Japanese are trying to create a rule of law, when they're trying to import the civil law tradition into the Korean Peninsula, that would have been much more riskier. So it was a strategy of incorporation, incorporating the local population and the elite local population. And once you get the elite Korean population into the judiciary, then the hope was for a trickle-down effect, that the general mass population would also fall in line. Of course, that didn't happen as seamlessly as the Japanese would have liked, but that was the intent. So when did the modern bar exam actually come into practice? Was it already under the Japanese occupation, or did it come afterwards? It started a little bit before the Japanese occupation um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, um, and then became slowly more formalized during the Japanese occupation, and of course even more formalized after that, uh, after World War II and the Korean War. So it was a steady progression. Seoul National University was formed in the 1960s for its law school system, and the others also was created around that time and subsequently to that time as well. A turning point in the legal education system were reforms in 2007, but before addressing them, how was the traditional, let's say, legal education system, so in 2006 and prior to that? Well, uh, it was primarily based on the LLB system in terms of the Korean education system, and then we can also talk about the Korean bar system. These are both what I would package as a traditional system. So under the traditional Korean law school system, then it was pretty much uh, an LLB system, a bachelor's in letters of law, and that was predicated on an undergraduate law major. How that links to the Korean bar is there wasn't actually much of a link. You didn't need to have an LLB. Uh, You don't need to have an undergraduate major in law or in any other discipline to sit for the Korean bar. And the thinking was similar to what was described before, was to democratize the process of sitting for the Korean bar. But the challenges still existed because so many people wanted to become Korean lawyers, therefore so many people wanted to sit for the Korean bar. But because the competition rate was so intense and so few people actually passed, sometimes the competition rate was uh, one person would pass and 60 people would fail. And so with those types of numbers, um, you have maybe a few success stories, but with every success, there are 60 people who failed. And so when you have a population, especially those who are probably arguably the top percentage of the student population who think they have a shot, but they end up failing, and sometimes failing for the very first time in their lives, in their formative years, that can have uh, ripple effects. And so that was some of the impetus for changing into the new Korean law school system, which took shape in about 2007, as you mentioned, and really the new law school system opened its doors with 25 government-approved law schools in 2009. And this is uh, several years on the back of the introduction of American-style law schools being introduced in nearby Japan. You mentioned how many students actually failed the exam. Was the exam based on objective standards? So you need to have 98% to pass or 100% to pass, or was it based on competition? Um, I'd say it's a little bit of both. I mean, there was certainly an formal or informal cap in terms of the number of people who would pass the bar. And that certainly even exists today. Today, the number would be roughly 1,000 left over from the traditional bar exam, which still exists today and will be phased out over time, and the new bar exam, which is roughly cut off at about 2,000 or so. So there's that and also the competition rate. So the combination of those two led to such a uh, intense competition rate and high failure rate for the Korean bar exam under the traditional system. So are you saying that under the traditional system, only a thousand people, give or take, could be lawyers at any time in Korea? Per year. And so that's very challenging because it doesn't really matter so much how many people are taking the bar, that the fact that there's a cap, arguably an artificial cap on the number of people who can pass the Korean bar every year. And when one sees a number like 1,000, you can say that it's not based on any type of scientific evidence or data. It's actually somewhat of a political measurement. You have just some number some that seems somewhat arbitrary. Why not 900? Why not 1,100? 1,000 seems quite convenient, probably too even of a number. So it raises questions. But the intent was that by having so few Korean bar exam passers, that that would increase the value of each Korean lawyer. 
there's an economic principle that says that scarcity drives value up. That's why diamonds are so expensive. And in essence, the Korean Bar Association and the existing uh, Korean lawyers from the traditional bar exam system wanted attorneys to be essentially like diamonds. They wanted to be very rare and very expensive and very value added. And so to a large degree, the Korean Bar Association, the Korean legal profession, they prospered because there was relatively little competition from uh, outside law firms, outside attorneys. But as Korea became more prominent, you know, as your podcast talks about, it's getting more and more global attention. More people want to do business here. Korea's entered into FTAs. Then what happens is that inevitably and almost by definition, uh, there is going to be foreign involvement, foreign entanglement or foreign M&As, joint ventures. And so Korean lawyers have to work with or compete against foreign lawyers. And then that created a stark awareness, arguably a self-awareness that said, listen, uh, to compete in this globalized era, and when we go head to head with other attorneys from the United States, from England, from Australia, from Germany, especially when it comes with negotiations and commercial dealings, we really need to somehow change the legal system because the legal system is predicated on basically rote memorization of codes, legal codes. And that might have worked during the Chosun dynasty, but it certainly is much less effective in the 21st century. So the effort towards globalization is one theme in the Graduate Law School Act that created these new law schools. So as you mentioned, in 2007, Korea passed the Graduate Law School Act with the purpose of following the United States legal education system. Why is that? And what is so special about the United States system? I mean, how was it different from Korea? Um, there are a lot of differences. And um, so one question is, why the American model and why not other countries' models? Under the traditional system, the legal education system of Korea, it was largely patterned after the civil law tradition of Germany and France, in particular Germany. A lot of the law professors, the faculty of law, received their PhDs from Germany. So this in part is taken from Japan, which was a civil law tradition. Japan in turn got it from Germany and France because during Japan's major restoration period beginning in 1868, it was looking to benchmark some of the global powers at the time because it felt embarrassed by having to sign, from their view, unequal treaties with Western powers. So wanted to fight fire with power. And so at that time, Otto von Bismarck was a huge political figurehead in world affairs. And so, in turn, it trickled down from Germany to Japan and then to Korea. And still today, there is a lot of respect for the German educational system and German academia, historically. But, especially in the 1990s, when globalization started to take more and more effect after the end of the Cold War and after the fall of the Soviet Union and so forth, there was greater you know, migration of talent and people. And so, in particular, the omnipresence of American businesses was one main reason why it was the American system. And with American businesses came American lawyers. So if you take a look at the front gate of this university, Ewa Women's University, if you look outside, what type of companies do you see of the foreign companies? They're primarily American companies. We have Starbucks, we, have, we used to have Dunkin' Donuts and so forth. And why is that? How did they get there? And why not other companies? Why not French companies and so forth? And you can make the argument that it's because the global footprint of American businesses is in part because when they bring their team over to negotiate, they bring with them lawyers because they have so many lawyers and they have specific skill sets. And if we go even further, the tradition under the American law school system is that law school education is at the graduate level, not the undergraduate level which then means that the undergraduate degree will be one that is different from law. So you have two academic skill sets, one in law from the graduate law school itself, and second, the one undergraduate degree that you had before. So let's say, as in my case, your undergraduate major is in economics, and then you get a law degree. Having a law and economics background is quite beneficial. You sort of have a competitive advantage because you can understand sort of the business financial aspects of the deal in addition to the legal contract provisions. It's basically one-stop shopping when going head-to-head -head with someone when all they know is the legal side of things. And that's quite constraining sometimes because when you think like a lawyer, generally but not always, you're defensively postured. You're trying to mitigate risk, but you're not maximizing opportunity. That's more of a business mindset. 
So to have someone who can think in both ways and think of creative solutions, that's what I think the Korean judiciary thought. We really need our lawyers for us to compete head to head with the likes of some of the top powers that we see and the top powers has so far economically been the U.S. that we need to comport our system to the American system. And also historically and culturally, you know, due to the Korean War and so forth, the U.S. is always on Koreans' radar screen. It's a love-hate relationship. I'm sure your other speakers on the podcast have talked to this. So on the one hand, I think Koreans may not always like the omnipresence of global brands and global influence everywhere in South Korea. But on the other hand, they respect it. How, how do they become such a power? We want to become a power like this. It's basically the old cliche, if you can't beat them, join them maybe. Something you mentioned just a bit earlier is that the Korean legal system was more based on memorandum and learning by hard cases. But it seems that the United States has a much more confrontational, much more theatrical legal system. Are we seeing a transport of that new system into Korea? Yes, a little bit. On paper and in theory, South Korea is a civil law tradition, so meaning that it's really based on codes rather than case law. And the other type of system would be the common law system, which is based on the UK. The US is also a common law country, basically wraps around case law and this concept called stare decisis, which basically stands for let the decision stand, where there has to be a consistent rendering of case rulings supported by case law from the top courts downward. So if the superior court or court that's higher up in the hierarchy ruled yes on a particular issue with similar facts, then lower courts generally must rule in the same way. So that's what stare decisis means, and that's how it's applied. So that's generally the difference. And I think it's confrontational, yes. Uh, it's adversarial, yes, the American law school system. South Korea's court system is really not like that. The courtroom, if you step into cases, public cases, Um, at the Seoul Superior Court or District Court in the Gangnam area, for example. It's very different the dynamics than in a U.S. court system, but there's elements of both. So today I think South Korea is a, really, in practice, a hybrid jurisdiction, meaning that there's elements of the continental European civil law tradition plus the U.K. and American common law system. So, for example, South Korean courts have experimented with a jury system, which is from the common law tradition. And in terms of business, it's really influenced by American commercial law. And that's because the U.S., by virtue of being the largest economy, has to deal with these cutting edge issues that other countries haven't. But on the other hand, that's not to say that the U.S. is always a leader when it comes to, for example, intellectual property, copyright, online issues, internet issues, then arguably the Korean courts are also on par or maybe even more cutting edge. And other courts around the world will look to the Korean courts and say, ah, they're ruling on it in this way, so we should think about it maybe in that way. That could be one benchmark, the way that the Korean courts are dealing with that issue. So yeah, it's a hybrid now. And I think Korea is facing a lot of issues that a lot of other countries are going to face or have faced. In my view, you'll see a great convergence Just like there's been a convergence of English as a business language, I think that really on paper, whether countries are civil law or common law, historically will matter less and less. There'll be a convergence because, at least from my experience as a former practitioner with the likes of Lehman Brothers and Barclays Capital, dealing with all sorts of lawyers from different countries, no matter what country they're from, uh, what type of food they eat, what their culture, when they talk about particular commercial issues, dealing with complex financial issues, there tends to be a convergence in how to think about this and how to get to solutions. So maybe there will be a greater convergence that Korea is following, has created. And I think we'll see more of that, not just in Korea as it experiments, because there's not one right answer now. There'll be maybe a South Korean model that other countries will look to, and there'll be other ways that uh, other countries will do. But China, for example, will look at South Korea, I'm sure. They'll also look at the U.S. So there's not going to be just a couple of great benchmarks and that's it. It's going to be a plethora of benchmarks, of which South Korea will be one of them. So what did the GLSA actually entail? You mentioned that there are 25 universities, graduate law schools. What else changed? Well, the GLSA itself has a few provisions that are, you know, some are more equal than others, but some are more pertinent than others. So one is... The fact that there's 25 law schools in itself, why not 30, why not 50? 
I think it was the short answer is South Korea looked at what Japan did. Japan basically allowed almost any university to convert into a graduate law school system. And what that did was create an oversupply of lawyers, new Japanese pengoshi or lawyers. And so South Korea didn't want that to happen. So what it did is placed a cap. Again, it's kind of a nice convenient number, 25. And then you wonder why is it not just 20 or 30? So then when you get to a number like 25, you must think, well, one side must have wanted 20, another side wanted 30, and they negotiated in the middle at 25. Another feature of it is that um, 50 of, of the 25 have to be in the Seoul or surrounding Seoul area, but the remaining 10 must be outside the Seoul metropolitan area. Um, that's mandated. And so, you know, one argument for it is that, well, that's good because what that does is sort of equalize the playing field. It doesn't create uh, a system where all the top law schools are in Seoul because the thinking is that most of the best schools are in Seoul. And this is under the Nomihan administration, whose mandate was to sort of equalize the playing field and avoid regionalism. But the counter argument is, you know, why place an artificial government cap on this? And so why not just let the best schools just be the best schools and make that the 25 law schools because the way that the 25 law schools are treated is a de facto law school ranking. These are the top 25 law schools. And each of the law schools of the 25 are given a specific quota of students. I think the largest number is to Seoul National University at 150, and I think the lowest number of students is 40. So that in itself, within the ranking of these are the top 25, there's another ranking. The law schools who are afforded and given the most student quotas are the higher ranked ones of those. But then that raises another question. With 40 students and you have a faculty of 20 or so, how do you maintain a sustainable you know, law school? The other part is that applying for the law school, you have to pass the LEET, the law school entrance test. And so that is very similar to the law school uh, admissions test, LSAT in the U.S. And the LSAT is basically a system in which it tests the way that you think. It does not test the accumulation of your knowledge. So it means that there won't be any questions about the law directly or even indirectly on that test. It will just give you conceptual questions and also reading comprehension questions. Uh, another component of the GLSA is that it focuses on the faculty. So 20% of the faculty must be practitioners um, and practitioners with five years of full-time experience or more. So that's a signal that uh, this law school system must be one that's not overly theoretical, which in turn must signal that the previous law school tradition was probably viewed as overly theoretical, which is probably taken from the German model, which is, you could say, it's very theory-based. So they want something that's more practical, more uh, professional, if you will, because the ultimate aim is to become a licensed attorney. And part of applying for these law schools is to submit a foreign language capability or competency exam result, typically you know, TOEFL or something of that nature. And that's another signal that the Korean judiciary wants a global Korean lawyer, no longer a provincial Korean lawyer. So uh, these are some of the things that distinguish it from the past. And I think if you put it all together, you see something that what is the ideal Korean attorney under the GLSA? It's someone who is uh, multilingual, probably multicultural, and who can is well versed in the theory, but also willing to get his or her hands dirty in the practice of things to form the ideal Korean attorney under this new law school system. But then this raises the question is, is that really what actually was created at the end of the day? So if you don't mind, I'm going to pick a few of the things you mentioned and try to go further. You mentioned that there are 25 universities, but what about all the other universities that did not get that status? I mean, did they just shut down or coexist right now? Yes, they do coexist. So for those who were selected, for example, Seoul National University, that means that they would have to shut down as part of the GLSA. They would be mandated to shut down their undergraduate law degree program and then create this new law school system at the graduate level. But those who weren't selected, the 25 who weren't selected, they could either just shut down their law department saying that, well, we weren't selected, so that's it. Or they could just continue with their law program. The challenge there is that because of this new law school system, really to pass the new Korean bar exam, you have to be a graduate of one of these 25 new law schools. But if you're not selected as one of the 25, then how do you sustain as a law department then? Who would want to go to your law school? 
well, they're going to keep the traditional Korean bar around for a little bit longer and phase it out, but it won't last forever. It'll be phased out in the next few years. So that's really the question. What do you do? Maybe you can focus more on, as you mentioned, the LLM or PhD programs to foster an academic PhD track. But really the choices are quite limited because of this. Um, what do they do? It's really up to each law school to figure out what to do. But there's a more downside than upside as a result of not being selected. The core idea behind this reform was to allow more people to actually pass the bar exam, but there's been criticism just very recently that close to 99% of students accepted to the top universities were actually between the age of 20 and 30. And that was a problem because only those wealthy enough to afford school, probably with their parents supporting them, were actually able to go there. Are we seeing a failure of the system already? Well, if it's a failure, I'm not saying that it is. It's, I would argue that it's not based on that metric. Uh, and the reason why is that the law school tuition and associated costs are direct costs, and you can calculate how much it'll be. If you take the law school system route today, then you know that if you're accepted that the chance is quite high of success because the passage rate for the Korean bar exam under the new law school system is relatively high it's over 50% as opposed to less than 5% before. Under the previous system, you can argue, well, you don't need to spend three years of graduate law school tuition. So it's cheaper, it's free, basically. But then think about the average successful exam passer under the traditional system took five years on average. Average age was about 29 years old. And that's the one out of 60 who passed. What about the other 60 who failed? five years of foregone income, five years of having to pay for their own room and accommodation, and also to take prep exams. So I don't know what's more painful. If I had to choose, I would say, listen, if a law school has accepted me, and I know the passage rate, if I take this route, is relatively high, and I know the costs, then I think that would be probably a lot better in terms of if I did the cost-benefit analysis than one where default is failure and the outlier is success, and it has similar downside costs too in terms of accommodation and so forth. Plus, there is a reputational risk of being branded a failure, which if you're branded a failure in South Korea, it's very different than in America or or Europe. Here, you only get one shot at something, and if you fail, people don't give you a chance to pick yourself back up and repackage yourself. It's sort of a scarlet letter. It's really hard to to redeem yourself after that. That's very unfortunate in this society. And so that's why, again, the law school system, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's not an expense per se. I would argue it's an investment. However, under the traditional system, I would say that it's more likely an expense and less of an investment. It's more like winning the lotto. You mentioned that there are actually quotas on what type of professor can teach. What about students? Are there quotas on what type of student can be recruited? A a certain percentage cannot come from law undergraduate majors. Uh, So everyone certainly needs to have an undergraduate major, but um, a certain percentage cannot be from undergraduate law majors. Um, So that's one restriction. But um, that's on paper. In practice, the people who do come from these undergraduate law majors seem to have an advantage um, in terms of not just getting in, but also passing the Korean bar. Because in in essence, it's basically repeating a lot of the same material twice. Um, you could argue that going even further, taking this analysis further, is that the new Korean law school systems at the graduate level is a repackaging of the same ingredients. Uh, because essentially you have the same faculty, except for maybe the 20% who are practitioners, but that means 80% are still the same. They still have PhDs primarily from Europe, maybe a little bit from the U.S., and maybe a few JDs from the U.S. recruited very, very recently because of being selected as one of the 25 law schools. But you could argue that, well, they're selected relatively recently, so it'll be the most junior. So they'll have little sway in terms of what to do in the law school pedagogy. So I think these law school graduates, you know, if they do get in, they do have an advantage. It's repackaged stuff. So there is an introduction more of the case method to sort of emulate the, they call the Langdellen model based on, Langdell was a former uh, dean at Harvard Law School. And it's sort of the way that uh, the American law school tradition is based upon. It's been around for almost a century. It's been untouched. 
which is basically the, the case law method where the professor just comes into class and really does very little lecturing. She or he just asks questions about cases. And really, you don't know anything about the black letter law until, ironically, after you graduate from law school and you take a prep course called Barbary, and then you learn the black letter law that you need to pass the bar. And you have literally about six or seven weeks, that's what the time I had, the time to first really study what the black letter law is and the bar exam, which takes two to three days all day. So the thinking there is under the American law school system, it doesn't teach you the law. That's not the faculty's job that anyone can learn and memorize. That's the easy part. It's how to think like a lawyer. So it's more the operating system. So the Korean law schools, is that the what's really being achieved, how to think like a lawyer? Well, in part, that's why the new law school professors are trying to use a case method, but it doesn't quite fit because under Korea's civil law tradition, the case law method is not really a big component. It's not binding in any sense upon the Korean judges to follow previous case law. In other words, there's not a concept of stare decisis that's found in the common law system. So it's mostly there so that there's something upon which the professors can ask questions to the students. And it's actually more fun that way, using the so-called Socratic system, as Socrates taught Aristotle by asking questions rather than telling him what things were. That leads to a certain type of irony, and as I argue in a paper I wrote, Socrates versus Confucius, there is at least to a clash, Socrates versus Confucius. Confucius being a system of educational tradition where there's a noted authority, a senior figure, to a more junior person, the student generally, where it's not based on inquisition, but it's based on merely lecture and basically statements that are held to be true and not to be questioned, as opposed to the Socratic system, which is almost the polar opposite, where there's not much lecturing, but it's really learning by asking pointed questions and going back and forth, a discourse, a debate, if you will. But this type of debate under the Confucian lens could arguably be construed or misconstrued as being something that goes against the natural order of the senior-junior relationship. Is it a fair assessment to say that the GSLA is actually trying to replace the Confucianist method by a more Socratic one, overall? Uh, Yes, on paper, yes. So it raises the challenge of South Korea's law school system and the professors in it, and the students also have the onus of trying to localize that, because simply you can't directly import something from the U.S. and say, well, there it is, that's the way we should do it. It has to be localized somewhat. So how do you localize this system? Because... In U.S. law schools, the Socratic method of teaching can be quite harsh, even by American standards. The professor can be quite confrontational to students, and the students, vice versa, can be quite confrontational to the professor. But that's not viewed as being anything bad. It's actually viewed as the duty of the professor and of the student. But that doesn't translate well. It's actually a lot lost in translation, pedagogically and culturally. So how to localize it, I think, what's been done so far is sort of a version of quote-unquote Socratic light. So letting students know beforehand, next class, you'll be chosen. This case, you're responsible for this. So you'll be delegated a lot of the questions that I'll be asking. You're responsible for it, so get ready. Um, And maybe not just individuals, because under Korea's culture, as you well know, picking on one particular student can be viewed as quite unfair or harsh. So a particular group rather than an individual. And so these types of things may be a good way to localize things. And this version of Socratic light may be one part of the solution. I think another part of the solution is really the students, because the students are the flexible ones. They're the ones who are more up to date with things. And they're actually arguably the more globalized component of this whole system. They're the ones who are younger, the more adaptable. They're the ones who um, are more exposed to the internet. They're the ones who've probably spent some years overseas at a formative age rather than in their 20s after military service in a graduate program in Germany or the U.S., you know, where being acclimated is a little more uncomfortable and takes much longer if it does happen at all. So I think that's why I'm hopeful because my bet is on the students of the current day and the future that they will actually transform this whole system and localize it and you know what I call the Confucian cultural constraints of the seniority system, San Hube system, is one that there can be freedom within that framework and the students can be respectful to the professors but also ask very pointed questions. So the students will know how to ask the question. They'll know what to ask but locally 
in a Korean cultural acceptable way how to phrase that question and what tone to ask that question, the body language to ask that question. I think that could be the compromise here that allows the Socratic system to transform into and adapt into this Confucian educational ecosystem. When you wrote this article, the first promotion of law school students had not graduated yet, but six years later, they have. So how have things evolved since then? For a lot of people involved, the best interests are really based on two success metrics. One is the Korean bar passage rate, and number two is job placement. So those two are have been fairly high, but the controversy surrounds both those, despite the high numbers. So with the high Korean bar passage rate, the people who are in the pro new law school camp, they argue, well, see, you know, this is a good thing because once you're in the Korean law school system, the new ones, that you're going to become a Korean lawyer and so your dreams have become fulfilled and realized. But the old guard, the Korean lawyers who were licensed and passed the old Korean bar, they'll say, listen, when we had to pass the Korean bar, the passage rate was 5%, not 70%, not 80%. This new bar exam is a joke. Anyone can pass it. So it's really doing a disservice to the reputation of Korean lawyers for us too, the old guard. It's too high, that number. So there's a back and forth there between the old guard and the new guard. And so for the firms who are hiring, the corporations and the law firm partners, who do they choose? I think in large part depends on who their clients are and in large part depends on who's doing the hiring. If they're from the old school system, then they're gonna want someone from their background With the high job placement rate, the job placement rate's been fairly high, but there have been accusations, truthful or not, I'm not quite sure, that there have been connections used and favoritism being used by the powers that be in academia and also in the job placement side. So I think this is somewhat to be expected when there's anything new implemented, especially what I would say at the revolutionary level as introducing a completely new way of legal education into a country that's fairly advanced, I'd say very advanced as South Korea is, you're going to have a lot of people who are happy, but a lot of people who have been displaced and whatnot. It's like switching over from a tape to CD and CD to MP3. There are going to be a lot of displaced people, and those people will vocalize their discontent. And that's what you see happening now. I wouldn't expect anything different. The question is, when the dust settles, what will happen? Eventually, people just have to accept the fact that this new law school system is going to be the way that it's going to be, but that there's no way to reverse the clock. So I think the question is how to make the Korean judiciary, the Korean lawyers, uh, old and new, work together and coalesce under this rubric known as the Republic of Korea and to have for everyone to realize that it's still one country and one judiciary, hopefully. Hopefully it doesn't become fragmented. And at the greater level is to say that it's not just us versus them. It's not just Korean lawyers versus American lawyers. It's not Korean lawyers versus German lawyers. It's that when these two come together, that they can create value together. That's the whole purpose, that Korean lawyers are not going to take the jobs of American lawyers, and American lawyers aren't going to take the jobs of Korean lawyers. These two complement one another. When you do a global deal, you need legal opinions on the Korean law side and the American law side when it involves both jurisdictions. And so that's good news for both. But only fear and lack of knowledge will create this type of suspicion and fear-mongering and saber-rattling, and hopefully that doesn't kill the deal. Changing slightly the topic, how does one actually become a procurer or a judge in Korea? You pass the bar exam and then what? Uh, Well, traditionally, you pass the Korean bar exam. And then after that, you take another bar exam after your first year at the JRTI, which stands for the Judicial Research Training Institute. And so that would be basically the top 10% or so of the Korean bar passage takers. So it's the elite of the elite. Something we have not addressed yet is what about those holding foreign law degrees What position do they play in Korea for the moment? Foreign attorneys would be what's known as FLCs, foreign legal consultants. And so they would basically um, espouse on the law of their licensed jurisdiction. So, for example, if a lawyer is licensed in New York, 
then that lawyer would be an FLC and it would talk about aspects and opine on aspects of New York state law, but nothing else, definitely not Korean law. And so I think that's why it's very complementary because for a Korean law firm, for example, let's take a Korean, large Korean law firm, it would need, of course, a lot of Korean lawyers, but it would also need some FLCs, FLCs from the U.S., from Germany, whatnot. So when there is a global deal or issues dealing with American law or German law, that they have the headcount for that and they could sign off on legal opinions or so forth or give advice to their clients on aspects of those domestic areas of law. Are they actually allowed to take the Korean bar exam? So long as they are accepted to the new Korean law school and they graduate from there, yes, there's nothing that forbids foreigners from taking the Korean bar exam and becoming a Korean lawyer. However, I th as a matter of practice, I think very few or almost none have passed in South Korea so far. So it's quite a challenge. It's still there in theory. Hopefully, maybe uh, history will be made one day. What would you say is the future of the Korean law education system? And what are the next steps that should be taken to improve it? Well, I think the future is really sort of to get away from the black letter law itself, because I think that is something that's just an issue of regurgitation, so exposure and regurgitation. And I think that's something that is something that can come on the back end, but really the processing power of the Korean lawyer, that is really critically important. And so I think the structure of problem solving is important and internationalization and negotiation, those three things. So decision making, I think how to make decisions. And this is a little bit sort of the MBA spirit. So, you know, a little bit of the McKinsey mind, decision trees, um, expectation value, present value, these types of things, uh, reading term sheets. Most law firms deal a lot with uh, business clients. And so if you're defending someone who's a uh, very serious criminal law issue, then you know this may not be applicable. But still, I think logic trees and so forth, these things that deal with uh, basic logic, and thinking logically, I think that would still play a role. Um, second is internationalization. I think this is not just in South Korea, but everywhere, but it's become an increasing trend. Not just internationalization, but an interdisciplinary approach. Not to think in a silo way of just the law being the law, and that's it. That's highly constraining. So to think more in terms of how Korean law connects with other types of law. So for example, there's a course called International Business Transactions, there's international public law, and make that more part of the core curriculum. And third is negotiations. And I think that's really important because the law is basically a thing, but how to get to that thing. So for example, how to get others, the judge, or maybe in the future, the jury, the other side to say, well, yes, the amount should be $300 million. Well, I think you might think that's the right amount, but how do you get the other side to think that way? A lot of it is in negotiating, and negotiating with, in, within the Korean context can be tricky. Often it can be very competitive, but it gets even trickier when you're dealing with people from other backgrounds. And in particular, if you're dealing with an education system where you have people who come from very wealthy backgrounds, and that's all they know how to relate with, and then how do you deal with people who are different from you? And maybe different economic classes, different communities, different countries but how to negotiate with them. And that deals with the human element. And underlying negotiation is psychology. It's also decision making. It's also emotion. And when people are just so focused spending time by themselves in front of a book for most of their lives or in front of a, their smartphone, then dealing with a human can be very uncomfortable, very unsettling. And that can lead to a lot of unfair or ultra-aggressive or non-optimal outcomes, you know, for the client or for the firm and just for society in general. So I think those three things are critically important for the Korean legal education system and also for the Korean judiciary, the lawyers out there that, you know, behind the fancy title, behind the license, that they are people and they're dealing with real people. I think there's a lot of theory involved when it deals with criminal law, for example, you're dealing with real victims, uh, you're dealing with real families who mourn for their loss, but it can't be treated like a simple page in a casebook or in a file or folder. 
And oftentimes I think that is the case, it seems. Maybe that they should spend some time with these, both sides, a day in the life of, rather than more getting more licenses or more degrees, get more human touch, more of a human touch. And I think that will help with a great understanding because ultimately the law is to get society to work better together, is to coalesce together. And, you know, it leads to the great questions, what's the right thing to do? You know, Immanuel Kant's moral imperative versus utilitarianism, which is a cost-benefit analysis. I think the world has really turned into a sort of crunching of the numbers with a cost-benefit analysis. But, you know, just because something is cheaper or a little bit relatively less risky, 49% versus 51% for the other side, then does that just make it the right thing to do? Or is there another moral code? So the search for the moral code, the search for the soul, the person, society where you want it to be. Every time a lawyer works on a case, you're chiseling one part of a greater sculpture, which is society. And how do you want that sculpture to be? If you don't think about it, if you're not aware of it, you know you're chiseling, but you don't really think about what the sculpture should be or you want it to be. But we really need more of an awareness. And that is really fostered best in the formative years during undergraduate years, maybe based on philosophy, of course, economics and these other disciplines, but also, you know, within the law school tradition. And I think that's very difficult because you must ask, who am I? And I think when you have so many people studying to become a lawyer, studying to become a government official, studying to get into the right university, their specs, that they don't know who they are. They know what their major is. They know what company they want to work for, but when they look in the mirror, who is that person looking back? I think that really, many people may not think so, but I strongly think that that's really the essence of being a lawyer. Professor Jasper Kim, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me on the podcast. It was a pleasure. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.